Thank you. So I don't usually take selfies during my talks, but this uh, opportunities and this setting is special. So let me just take one. Please wave your hands to show that you're here. Okay, that's it. Uh, my name is Jacek Kunicki. Uh, I work at Software Mill. We're a software consultancy. We write code like everyone does. Uh, probably most of you. Uh, there are, however, two special things about us uh, that make us unique. The first one is that we are a fully remote company, so we don't have an office. And the second one uh, is that we have a completely flat structure. We have a full uh, internal transparency, including the financial one. So if you are eager to learn how it can work or how it cannot work, please feel free to catch me after the talk. And today we will talk uh, about uh, using or not using reactive streams in Java 9 Plus. Actually, I'm going to tell you uh, how to use them properly and how not to use them. So what you should be doing, what you should not be doing with reactive streams in Java 9 Plus. Let's start with a quick recap what stream processing in general is and what reactive streams actually are. So in a stream processing environment, uh, you start with some source of your data. You can call it a producer. Uh, you have some kind of destination for your data, which you can call a consumer, and you have a number of intermediate processing stages in the middle, so the stages that do something with your data. And typically, you have data f flowing from, uh, from left to right, so from the consumer through the stages uh, to the, from the producer to the stages to the consumer. Now, if you imagine what can go wrong uh, in such an architecture, uh, there is one, one situation when the, when the producing side, so when the producer is faster than the consumer. Because then uh, we, need, we have some excessive data that we need to deal with somehow. And there are, of course, different, uh, different strategies to deal with this excessive data. Uh, for example, the, like the simplest one that you can think of is just dropping the excessive data. It is actually not something very uncommon, because if you, if you look, for example, at the networking hardware, uh, this is something that actually happens there. So if you have some uh, excessive data that, are, that is not able to, to be handled, then it is just dropped. Uh, another approach is, for example, to block. So the, the, the slower consumer can, can just block and not allow the, the faster consumer to, to, to send data to it. And then the, the producer is basically blocked. The consumer does his job, and only when it's done, next data, the next data can be processed. Uh, another strategy to deal with excessive data is, for example, to buffer it. But buffers, as most, uh, most of the things inside a computer, are limited. So if you have really a lot of data coming from a fast producer, and you have a slow consumer that is buffering the data, that, that, then there is a danger that the buffer is going to overflow. So you're going to get an out-of-memory error or something like that. So the, the last approach that I'm going to talk about in some more detail, and which is actually used in, the, in, in reactive streams, is called back pressure. And back pressure is basically a way for, uh, for, the, for a slower consumer to slow down the producer. So you can think of back pressure as, uh, as, as another kind of data that is flowing in the opposite direction. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going upwards in the stream, and it's basically a way for a, for a consumer to slow down the producer. So, so to tell the producer that it, uh, you are too fast, I'm not able to accept that much data. Uh, now there's a small digression about naming, because this is like a general, uh, general naming for, for stream processing pipelines. Uh, in, in Java 9, the, the, the interfaces have their own names. So the producer is called the publisher. The consumer is called the subscriber. And the processing stages are called processors. So this, uh, what, what you can see in the slide is like the uh, uh, general uh, stream processing pipeline. But this is not yet reactive. So what do we need to do to make it reactive? Well, first of all, it needs to be asynchronous. So for example, when, when I spoke about ways to handle excessive data, I mentioned blocking. So blocking really is not the way to go in a reactive, uh, in a reactive stream, because you need, to, you need to act asynchronously. Also, the back pressure, so the mechanism for a slow consumer to tell the producer that it's too fast and to slow it down, needs to be non-blocking. So it, uh, also the, the, data cannot, the data flow cannot be blocking, and the back pressure flow can, cannot be either. Uh, this is important because uh, in, a, in a reactive setting, so in a non-blocking setting, you should really be able to reuse threads whenever it's possible. And doing, doing non-blocking back pressure, so the non-blocking communication to upstream, uh, should, also, should also make the computer able, the, the processor able to reuse the threads whenever it's possible. Now, another important thing in, rea in, in a reactive stream uh, is that the slower consumers are somehow represented in a domain model. And I have two examples here. 
Uh, the first one is a Twitter API. So if you, uh, uh, if, if the Twitter, uh, Twitter exposes an API which lets you like connect to a stream of tweets, and then it allocates a buffer that from which you can consume. And normally, when you when you consume f with a good enough speed from the buffer, you're just getting the data. But uh, if if the Twitter endpoint detects that you are performing too slow, it actually can put uh, some special message inside that buffer that tells you that hey, you are doing too slow. If you don't speed up in in, in some some amount of time, then I'm going to drop the connection. So this is uh, this is something something new. You may you may think of it like something new because you don't just get the data inside the stream, but you also have some uh, some signals that are telling you that you need to speed up. For example, here. Uh, another example comes from the Akka Streams API, and it's uh, this is a stage. So one of the intermediate uh, building blocks in a stream. Uh, this stage is called Conflate. And conflate, what, what it basically does, it's uh, when it detects that the downstream is slower, it aggregates the data uh, instead of just sending it downstream. And only when the when the downstream becomes fast enough, uh, it starts it, it emits uh, some kind of aggregated data. And now this is some really, really nothing too original because well it's just buffering. But the important thing here is that uh, actually this is somehow included in the domain model. So in the, you have a processing stage built in in Akka Streams that is aware of the fact that the downstream can be slower. And it's able somehow to deal with it. Now, starting from Java 9, uh, there are some new interfaces uh, which are in the Java Util Concurrent Flow class. Uh, there are actually four of them. I'm now going to quickly cover uh, what they are here for and what they look like. So the first one is a publisher. Publisher is it's pretty straightforward. Basically, it produces elements of some given type T, and uh, it has a possibility to send them to subscribers that are that are then going to consume those elements. And it exposes a single method called subscribe, uh, which subscribers are going are, are using to connect to the producer to the publisher. So we have a publisher. This is the like beginning of our pipeline. Then at the end we have the subscriber. So subscriber basically consumes element from the publisher. Uh, it needs to call subscribe on the publisher in order to receive, uh, for example, uh, a, a confirmation of the subscription. Uh, I will cover subscription, what subscription is later. So it, it, uh, it can receive an unsubscribe callback. Then it can receive data via, via the on next callback. And it also exposes methods for receiving some other signals, like on error for signaling errors, and on complete for signaling completion. So we covered the publisher, we covered the subscriber, so the variants of our pipeline. Now we have a subscription. A subscription is actually nothing more than a representation of a link between a publisher and a subscriber. And it allows for two things. It allows for back pressuring. So here, here is the place where the actually most important part of reactive streams, the back pressure, comes into play. So subscription is the, is the link between a publisher and a subscriber, and it's, uh, it allows, among others, for back pressuring with the request uh, method. It also uh, allows for cancelings or, or termi terminating the flow with a cancel method. Now the last interface that we have is a processor, and processor is something really simple because it's basically uh, something that is both a publisher and a subscriber, so it has, it, it has two ends. Publisher had a single end that emitted the data, subscriber had a single end that received the data, and then you have a processor that has two ends, and it's able both to receive and to, uh, to emit the data. So now in a, in a typical scenario, what is called first is the subscribe method on the publisher, because we have a subscriber that connects to the publisher. And then it can receive the unsubscribe callback, as I mentioned. Then, after, re after receiving the subscription, it can receive an arbitrary number of uh, on next callbacks with data. And then it's either completed successfully or with an error. So I assume everyone here uh, uh, is a developer, probably. So when you see such simple interfaces, um, I would assume that the first thing you think of is implementing them. So let's actually try to do it and try to implement those interfaces. So what we are going to do is try to implement a, a simple publisher for data. It's going to hold an iterator of integers. Uh, and then when, when a subscriber connects, it's going to emit uh, the iterator until it's exhausted. So now in a, in a, in a very naive approach, uh, what you could actually try to do as, a, as, the, as, the very, as the first very simple implementation is just to take the iterator, take all the remaining elements, and just send them to the subscriber. 
And then perhaps you also want to signal completion, so when the iterator is exhausted, you want to tell the subscriber that we are done. So you're going to call incomplete. So let's see whether it can, act, it can work at all. To do this, we need a main method that is actually going to run it. Uh, we're going to create a new simple publisher with 10 elements to emit downstream. And we're going to call subscribe, because we need to provide a subscriber that is going to consume the data. And we're going to create an anonymous instance of a subscriber and implement a part, uh, like part of its methods. So I'm not going to implement on subscribe yet. I'm going to start with, with on next. And those implementation is going to be very, very, very simple. So here we're just going to print out the elements that we received. The same is going to happen with any errors that we receive. So we're just going to print them out. And then on, uh, on completion, we're also going to just write to standard output uh, an information that it, it, it has been completed. So we just print complete. So this is a very simple implementation of, of a subscriber that is connected to our very simple publisher that just takes the iterator, iterates over it, and sends all the data downstream. Let's run it and see if it works. So this is an old machine, so you need to be patient. Yeah, well, we have 10 elements that have been emitted and received by the subscriber. We have the completion signal that has been received, so looks good. But you may wonder whether it's that simple to implement a, a publisher yourself, a reactive one, and it's not. Now, when you, when you want to implement something that is reactive, so something that is going to behave correctly when connected to other reactive components, you actually have a, like a, a huge, huge number of requirements that it's, it, it's, it needs to stick to. And actually, those, all those requirements are covered in something that is called the TCK, or Technology Compatibility Kit for reactive streams. And uh, the TCK describes all the principles that the reactive components need to follow. And it also gives you some, some, re some pre already prepared tests that you can run against, against your implementation. And this is what we are going to do now. So we have some simple publisher test that uses the flow publisher verification, which is a, a base class from the TCK, that actually is going to use an instance of our simple publisher and run all the tests for a reactive publisher against our implementation. So let's see what's going to happen. And now you can see that this doesn't really look good. So we have a single past test, which may be a random one, but we have 15 of them failed. So as you may have expected, our implementation is far from perfect. So, well, it, it seems to do its job, but it's really not a reactive one. So let's now try to fix it a bit to see, uh, to see what the potential problems are and, uh, and, and what we can do about them. So for example, we'll start with the 1.109 error which says that uh, an unsubscribe callback must be issued when a non null subscriber is connected. So this is when, you, when you, you may remember from the slides that a subscriber, after connecting to a publisher, needs to receive an unsubscribe callback. And we are actually not doing it. That's why the, error, well, the test fails. So let's try to implement it. So getting back to our publisher, uh, we are not going to need the main method anymore. Let's just delete this code. And now we are expected to call on subscribe on a subscriber, so let's do it. And here you can already see that uh, what we need here is a subscription. As you may remember, the subscription acts as a link between the publisher and the subscriber, so we need, we need to have one. So we are doing simple stuff here, so let's call it simple subscription. And what we are actually going to do is pass the subscriber instance there, because we want to move the, all, all the communication between, between the publisher and the, and the subscriber uh, ins inside the subscription. So now it's going to be the subscription that will manage all the communication, so the back pressure and other things. Uh, so now we're going to create inner, an inner class for our subscription. Uh, we have the instance of a subscriber. Uh, we want to store it as a field in our class. 
And then we also need to implement the methods that are required by the subscription interface. Uh, as you may remember, there are two of them. First one is, is request for handling, for dealing with back pressure and then handling the request from downstream. And the other one is cancel. So let's start with, uh, with implementing request. So in request, we are receiving a number that tells us how many, how many elements the downstream wants. And our goal here is to send uh, no more than n elements to the downstream. So let's just do it as, as simple as it's possible. So I, I'm just going to use a for loop uh, with a variable called demand. I'm going to initialize it with n. Uh, then the condition is going to be that the demand is greater than zero, and also that the iterator has some more elements to provide, because if the uh, iterator is exhausted, we actually don't have anything to send downstream. So I'm going to add iterator has next here. And I'm going to decrease the demand. And now inside the for loop, what we are going to do is just take the subscriber, uh, you call the on next callback to send the next element to the subscriber, and the next element is going to be the next element taken from the iterator. So this way we are, we are just sending n elements to the downstream using the subscriber on next callback. And now when we are done sending this n elements, uh, it would be good to check whether the iterator has any more elements, because if it has not, it will be a good idea to send a completion signal to the subscriber to signal that we are done, basically. So here we'll say if not uh, iterator has next, we are going to say subscriber on complete. So once again, what we do here is basically send uh, n elements downstream, then check whether the iterator has any more elements. If it doesn't, we, co we, complete the, we, we send the completion signal to the subscriber. So let's run the test once again and see what happens. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so actually, uh, actually there is some wo one long running test there. So I'm going to stop the previous run and just run it once again. And you may remember that we are looking at 109, uh, which required us to issue an unsubscribe -subs callback for an unnow subscriber, and this is what actually happened. So there are still some failed tests, but at least we are able to, to fix something. So let's now try to fix some more stuff. For example, if we look at 309, it says that when a negative number of elements is requested, we need to signal an error with an illegal argument exception, or the same should happen when there is zero elements. So we basically should handle an edge case where n in our request is less or equal to zero. This sounds simple, so let's try to do it. So here I'm just going to put a, a simple check if n is less than equal to zero. And then we need to signal an illegal argument exception. But it is important that we are not just allowed to throw an exception here, because all the, all, all the error communication also needs to be handled via callbacks. So instead of just throwing the exception, we're, we need to use the error callback from the subscriber to pass the exception this way. So new illegal argument exception. And that's pretty much it. So what we did now is, is, is just check the edge case where zero or, le or less elements were requested. And then you can see that 309 is passing. So we, we fixed another error. Well, we're doing really good, so I'm going to try to fix another one. Uh, and this is actually, or even two of them. So if you look at 105, it says that we, we need to signal uh, completion when, the, when a stream terminates. And when you look at 107, it says that, one, that uh, once we complete, we should not be sending any more elements. So those two errors suggest that we, we are doing something wrong with, with signaling termination of our stream, uh, which actually means that we are missing some internal state of our, of our subscription that would be able to tell whether it has, been, it has been terminated or not. Because you need to remember that this is a multi-threaded environment, so it needs to behave correctly, even in such a setting. Uh, so to hold this state, we're going to use an atomic boolean and call it terminated, terminated, and initialize it with false. So this makes sense. Initially, we're not terminated. 
And now the like, first most obvious place to, to set the terminated value is in the cancel method. So whenever we receive a cancel signal, uh, we, need to, we want to set the terminated flag to true to indicate that we are done. And there are two more places where we need to check it. So the first one is before sending an element downstream. So apart from uh, checking whether the iterator has any more av elements available, we also need to check whether we are not terminated. So we need to add another condition here. Not terminated dot get. So this is an additional check, because if we have been terminated, we don't really want to send anything downstream. And the second error was about signaling completion uh, too many times. So what we want to do is also check the terminated flag here, because once we signaled completion to the subscriber, we don't want to do it any, uh, anymore. Uh, so here, theoretically, I, I, uh, just using get here would be enough. But if you think about it carefully, uh, it turns out that apart from taking the value, from, of, from terminated, uh, we would also need to set it to true, so to, to actually indicate that we are terminated because we are sending the completion signal. So if we decide to, to, to send the completion signal by subscriber on complete, we should also set the flag to true to indicate that we are terminated. And actually, Atomic Boolean offers a method that uh, lets us do it atomically. So we can read the value uh, and then set it to something else. And that's what we'll be using here. So we'll be using get and set uh, with, uh, with value with the value of true. And of course, it's not terminated, get and set here. So what it does, it, it takes the value from the atomic boolean, check whether it's false, uh, and, and uh, w w whatever the value was, it's setting it to true to signal termination. So once again, what we did here was to introduce some internal state uh, called terminated, an atomic boolean that basically holds the information whether we're done or not. And we are using it in several places. First, so when we receive a cancel signal uh, in our subscription, then we set it to true. And also, we check the flag before sending anything downstream or signaling completion. Let's see if it helped. So now, it's, it's much better, I would say, uh, because we are uh, we're left with only two failing tests, and actually, uh, all, all the rest is passing. Uh, so let's now focus on, uh, on those two that are failing. So one of them is about unbounded recursion, and the second one is about handling long max value. So handling long max value is basically something about an infinite demand that we are receiving. So let's have a look at those. Uh, so the first one was unbounded recursion, and uh, unbounded recursion can happen uh, when we have a synchronous implementation of our, of our subscription. And that's what we actually did, because we didn't start any threads, we didn't do the request handling in, uh, in an asynchronous way, all we did was synch synchronous. And actually, uh, what we did in our request, me request method was calling on next on the, on the subscriber, and then it turns out that usually a subscriber, when it receives on next, so it receives the next element, then it processes it, and what it does next, well, it requests new elements. So it's going to call request again. And then we are getting into a, a kind of infinite loop. So in request, we are calling on next. But then on next, in turn, is going to call request again. And this is the unbounded recursion. This is only a problem in an uh, asynchronous implementation. So this is like a, a hint that uh, when you are creating a, your own publisher, for example, you shouldn't be doing it synchronously. There should be something asynchronous inside in order to, to, to not, not to get into this kind of problems. But then if you go uh, with an asynchronous implementation, there are some other problems that you may face. And they are, for example, related to handling the infinite demand, so basically the thing that you just saw. And the problem is that, for example, if you're allocating threads for, for, handling, uh, for, 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 for handling your request calls, and, and you receive, and, and the n is going to be long max value, so something very big, then you're certainly going to like, run out of threads. Because, well, you can allocate a, a number of threads on a, on a machine, but certainly not long max value threads. So this is going to blow out. So then you may think about, for example, accumulating the demand somehow, storing it at a long value, but then you may, you may have a problem of, uh, of just an, of a number overflow, because if you receive two, re two request calls with both, uh, uh, both with a long max value uh, as, as the parameter, then, well, you, you, you're not going to be able just to store it, because it's going to blow out as well. 
So actually, the takeaway here from, from this short demo and this my, my like attempts to fix the, the errors that we are getting from the TCK is that you really shouldn't be implementing those interfaces yourself. Uh, however, however simple they may seem, it's not really a good idea to, to just go and implement them. Of course, if you are implementing a library, you can be doing it because that's actually what the interfaces are there for. So the goal of the interfaces, the, what, what they are here for in the JDK, is an SPI, which stands for a Service Provider Interface. And the Service Provider Interface is basically a unification layer for different implementations, so for different libraries that are going to behave in a, in a reactive fashion. So if you are implementing a library, go for it, but just don't, don't, don't just try to, do, to, to implement them yourselves, rather use something that is, that is thoroughly tested. Now, the idea and the, the reason why, the, why a unification layer is needed is that, for example, there are already some, some streaming abstractions in the JDK itself. So when you look at them, you can just start, for example, by the file I.O. So you have an input stream and an output stream, which even if, as even the names suggest, are something about, about streaming. You have and many more things, like an iterator. Well, it's, it, it may, it, it's, it's not a stream, really, but it also exposes something like a streaming behavior because you don't process everything at once, but just send an element by element. You have the new I.O. with channels. Uh, in the most recent uh, serverless specification, I think it's 3.1, you also have read and write listeners, which also behave in an asynchronous fashion, and they can resemble streaming, in a way. Uh, you have Java SQL result set, which usually is backed by a cursor in a database, so this is also something that you can think of as a stream, because it, send, it sends chunks of data and not all the data at once. Well, you have streams from Java 8, so this is something that certainly exposes a streaming behavior. And in Java 9, you have this uh, Java Util Concurrent Flow and all the interfaces that we have just covered. Now the problem is that like all of this abstraction exposes a different API and it's really really hard to connect them together. And if you think about how a how a publisher connects to a subscriber with a single subscribe method, this is not what you can do yet. So you are not able to to, to read files and, and transfer data between files or between a file and a database, for example. And actually, this single call that you have here is very important because, well, it's, what it does by connecting the publisher to a subscriber is to establish a link that is responsible for back pressure, so for handling different speeds of the publisher and the subscriber. And it also handles, uh, handles cancellation, handles termination, and uh, deals with error handling. So this is a single call that is, that is really important, and it would be nice to, to have something like that in the JDK, and then using it, be able to connect all the, all the different streaming abstractions. But that's unfortunately not what we have in the JDK at the moment. So let's, uh, let's have a quick look at, uh, I would say, nice to have. So what, what, it would be, what it would be nice to have in the JDK to be able to play with this uh, streaming abstractions in a reactive way. So the first thing uh, we would be happy to have is uh, some, some minimum operation set on the streams. So at the moment, as you, as you saw, there are only those four interfaces, and there is uh, actually no implementation. Well, there is one actually. It's called a submission publisher, and this is like a, a, a demo contained in the JDK, how you can use it. But the submission publisher is synchronous, and as you saw previously, you, when, when we ran the TCK test uh, against our implementation, which was synchronous as well, it didn't really work well. So the submission publisher is also not the like, best implementation to use because it's synchronous, so it doesn't really, it's not going to play well with other asynchronous reactive components. What we are lacking, for example, are some, some basic operations on the stream itself. So if, you, if you're familiar with other streaming, st reactive streams implementations like Project Reactor, RxJava, or Akka streams, there's a number of, of, of stream combinators or whatever you call them. So th th those are methods like filter or map or something else that you can just uh, run on your stream and do, do some transformations. And actually, in the JDK, you are missing even those. So there is, th th there, there is no, no filter, no map on the stream. You just have the interfaces. And actually, there is an initiative from Lightband called Reactive Streams Utils. Uh, and uh, uh, it, its goal is to provide uh, a pluggable, pluggable implementation of, the, of, of, of some operations on the stream. So the idea is that the basic operations, uh, like filter or map that I just covered, should be there in the JDK, so they, they should be provided out of the box. 
but then it would be nice to, to be able to choose your, your, the implementation you want to use for the more advanced stuff, so for the more, more advanced combinators. And this would, uh, this, this would just work by setting a proper system parameter. But certainly when it comes to like, things in, our, in, in the Java ecosystem, there is also some politics. And here, uh, as in some other places, we have a uh, like fight between Spring and uh, Java EE or Jakarta EE. So the, the, the yellow and blue logo here is Jakarta EE, so that, which is the new Java EE. And well, if you think of Spring, for example, and its support for Reactive, well, Spring is already using uh, Project Reactor, so actually people who are using Spring and who are responsible for like, de developing Spring are not really interested in including all the Reactive stuff uh, in the JDK because, well, they are using Project Reactor, so why would they care about, uh, about using something else? On the other hand, there is a lot of companies that are actually using Java EE or Jakarta EE, and they would be happy to have all those, uh, all, all those even simple implementations inside the JDK because they want to use, stick to the, to the Java APIs and not use uh, something like Spring. So looking uh, like further into the future, uh, in a possible future because no one says it's going to happen, let's see other nice to have. So for example, if you think about HTTP and making the HTTP goals in a, in a reactive way, well, there is async server I.O. Uh, since server 3.1. And actually, there is an HTTP client in JDK 9 uh, that is able to deal with the reactive interfaces. So, for example, it exposes a post method that takes a publisher, and then it's, it's able to deal uh, with the data from the publisher. Uh, so, for example, if, if the server I.O. Exposed, uh, also exposed the publisher to, 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 like to, to using the data uh, contained in the request, which it doesn't do now because it, it, has some, uh, it has some read and write listeners, but it doesn't have the reactive interfaces. Then if you, if you think about the task of uploading a file, uh, this would become something very simple, like using the post method that accepts a publisher and using the like, hypothetical publisher from the, from the server request. So here the re uh, request get publisher method is something that is not there, uh, but it would be nice to have something like that, because then you would, you would be able to set up a file upload with a single line, and it will, all, all things like back pressure, error handling, signaling completion will be dealt with under the hood. And your responsibility would only be to connect those two with the single method. Another place where we could see some improvement is, for example, database access. So there is something called ADBA, which is called Asynchronous Database Access API, and it's actually going to, to be a part of the JDK. Uh, this is something like uh, Asynchronous JDBC, but it's not a, not a wrapper for JDBC. It's something they, they are implementing from scratch. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, they tried to incorporate the reactive interfaces there as well. But unfortunately, it turned out that implementing them, uh, as you've already seen, is not trivial. So they, so at the moment, they have dropped support for reactive, uh, for reactive implementations, for the reactive interfaces inside ADBA. So there is going to be some asynchronous database connectivity, but really without the reactive interfaces. There are, of course, some vendor-specific uh, asynchronous drivers. Uh, some of them support the reactive interfaces. But still, they are vendor-specific. They are not the part of the JDK, so they are not something that you have available out of the box when you just download the JDK and have it in place. So when you think of, uh, of how you use JPA, and for example, if, if, if you fetch a result list from a database, then you receive a list of, uh, a list of objects. But what if you were able to do something like this? So d like create a JPA query and then instead of getting a result list, get a publisher, which instead of giving you a list, will give you a publisher of data. And then you will be able to consume the data from the database, not from a list, but actually from, from something that is reactive. This is, of course, something that is not there yet in the JPA. And just as a reminder, those are like nice to have, so things that would be, would be good to, to, ex to, to exist in the JTK, and so that we'll be able to connect everything with the, uh, with the reactive way. There is certainly more. So for example, you can think of a reactive file I.O. Uh, if, if you think, for example, about transferring data from one file to another, so today, if you wanted to do it with the input and output stream, you need to allocate a buffer yourself and then like, deal with uh, reading data to the buffer, then writing it to a file. But if, you were, if, if the file I, uh, APIs support the reactive streams, you would once again be able to do it with, uh, with the subscribe method, with a single one, that would deal with the back pressure and all the good things. JMS is another example where this could be useful because this is like something that you can 
can also think of as a, as a streaming pipeline, actually, by s sending the messages with slower and, and faster parties. Uh, WebSockets is another example, so this is also about sending chunks of data. Uh, for example, AWS, uh, and actually AWS is working on supporting the, the reactive interfaces, but it turns out that they are uh, using them internally. So, uh, so the API they, they are exposing is not, uh, is not giving you access to the, to the reactive interfaces, but th they are using it, uh, it instead. So this is, well, this is partially good, but it would be perfect if they just expose the interfaces, and then you would, for example, uh, have a, a subscriber from AWS to which you would be able to, to pipe your, your data to upload it to S3, for example. There is also Project Alpaca from Lightband. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a set of connectors for ACCA streams, so for one of the reactive streams implementations. Alpaca is something like, like Apache Camel, but, uh, but it works in a reactive, in a non-blocking way. Camel is blocking most of the times, Alpaca is not, so this is a completely different model. So you could say that it's there, but again, we are thinking about things that it would be nice to have in the JDK. So this is still an external library, but at least you have some reactive connectors to, to the outside world. So since there is really not much to show about integrating different libraries, because the, the examples you saw are, are, are really about something that may be there in the future, but I, I, I wanted to do some, some, some kind of demo for, for, the actual, for the SPI parts, so for the, for the unification layer for different implementations of reactive streams. So what I'm going to show now is a very simple pipeline that is going to use three different implementations of reactive streams. So we are, we are going to start with a publisher that will be constructed with Project Reactor's Flux. Uh, then we are going to use Akka Streams in the middle to do some processing. And eventually we're going to use RxJava as a subscriber. So those are like three implementations of reactive, stream, reactive streams, each of them like having its own world. But actually it turns out that uh, using the new interfaces that are there in the JDK, we'll be able to connect them and, and make them work together. So if you look at this example code, well, what we have here is a, is a publisher from Project Reactor. Then we have a processor from Akka Streams. So this is this one. Uh, then we are using uh, using subscribe to connect those two. So this once again makes the like the, the the process or read data from the publisher, and eventually we're using the flowable from RxJava uh, to attach to the Akka Streams processor and to, to to read the data and then to just to, just to write it to standard output. Now, if you if you look at the implementations. Uh, you see that the interfaces here are actually the unified ones. So this is where the, where the reactive streams interfaces from Java 9 come into play, because we are, uh, we are using different implementations, but the interfaces on top are the same. And if you look at the actual implementation, you can see that this is indeed a flux, so a project reactor source of, of numbers here, because fl what flux interval does, it basically emits a number every, every one second here. And then you need to use some glue code, which you can see here. Uh, to be able to convert the project reactor interfaces to the reactive streams ones. Because as I said, like every implementation has its own world. But now since the reactive interfaces are in the JDK, you have a way to like lift the, the for example here project flux representation to the Java 9 interfaces. And something similar happens in the processor. So here you can see that we are indeed using the flow, which is, uh, which is the Akka Streams DSL for, the, for, for, the, for a processor, for, so for an, a component that is doing some transformations to the data. And what it does is negating the long values it's going to receive, so because we are using map from i to minus i here. And once again, we need to use some glue code here. So we had the Akka Streams uh, API uh, uh, as a flow, and then we want to lift it to the, to the reactive interfaces using Java Flow support here. And here you can uh, actually see some, some, some nuances that show that uh, the implementations of reactive streams work, work differently. So for example, if you want, wanted to use the glue code from, from Project Reactor, you just code publisher to flow publisher, and it's there. But in Akka Streams, you need to use something like a materializer. And the reason is that uh, Akka Streams uses a, a bit different approach to like, constructing the entire pipeline because it, it separates the, the recipe for processing data from the actual runtime. And the materializer you see here is the, is the runtime that, you, that, that is separated from the definition of the stream and uh, you are using it to, to actually run the stream. So that's, and, and you need to be explicit about creating it. 
So in, in Project Reactor, it's somehow hidden under the hood, so you don't know anything about the runtime, but in ACCA streams, you actually need to create the runtime yourself as the materializer. Okay, so let's see whether it works. It takes some time to start, and then you can see zero, which is not negated, and the other numbers are negated. So you can see that we were actually able to connect different implementations of reactive streams using the, using the interfaces. And once again, this is the actual goal of, uh, of the interfaces being there in, in JDK. So it's, it's like a unification layer for different, uh, different implementations, different libraries that implement the concepts of, of reactive streams. You saw some error there. This is due to the fact that we are not handling termination gracefully, but this was just a simple example, so let's just forget about it. So to wrap it up, as you have seen, this is what we have in the JDK is certainly not a full reactive streams implementation, because apart from the, from the interfaces and apart from the single synchronous implementation, the submission publisher, we don't really have anything more, like uh, even simple stream combinators like filter or map. Uh, it is rather an SPI, so a service provider interface that allows uh, different, different libraries that implement reactive streams to work, uh, work gracefully uh, w with each other so that they are basically able to connect and to interchange the data in a reactive fashion. You have also seen that uh, implementing those interfaces yourself is really not trivial. So what we were trying to do here was implementing a publisher. So publisher, when you think of complexity, is somewhere in the middle. So cons like the, the subscribers are the, are, are the like, easiest to implement, the publishers are somewhere in the middle, and processors are the most, uh, most difficult to implement. So you need to remember about it, and whenever you think about implementing it yourself, because it's not that you are, uh, it's not that it's forbidden to do it, but it's rather, you should think carefully whether you shouldn't rather be using some, some ready implementation that was, that was tested thoroughly. But if you decide to implement it yourself, be sure to use the TCK. And once again, TCK is basically a set of rules that tells you how, how the components should be implemented so that they can work nicely one with, one with another, so that all the, all, all the reactive behavior is preserved. And it also gives you the, the test. So the test, testing part is the, the most important one that you really should be using it uh, while doing your own implementation. Because as you, as you saw in, in the live coding at the beginning, this is really not, 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 not trivial to do it. And we, when you start with, with doing something in a very simple way and with a synchronous way, it's a lot of things kind of go wrong. And th those are things that you really wouldn't think of if you didn't have the, the, the TCK and the tests at hand. So be sure to at least have a look at the TCK. Okay. There are some resources if you want to dive deeper after this talk. Uh, the first one is the pluggable runtime, so the, the idea that you have some uh, basic operations built in and then you have a runtime that you uh, can use to, to give you all the, other, all the other combinators. And this is Reactive Streams Utils from Lightband. There is the TCK, which like it's, I, I could stress it infinitely, that it's really important to have a look at it if you want to implement something, some of the interfaces yourself. There is a blog about ADBA, which, as I said, unfortunately, probably won't be supporting the reactive interfaces, but if you are uh, like into reading about asynchronous database connectivity, anyway, have a look at it. And there is a nice, uh, nice blog series about uh, advanced reactive Java. Uh, it also covers uh, some of the things I covered here, like trying to correctly implement the interfaces yourself. So normally, when you, when, when you Google for reactive streams Java 9, you have a number of, of blog posts that actually tell you how to, that hey, there are four simple interfaces, let's implement them. They are so, showing some simple implementations, but they are really not mentioning the TCK, so they are, they are missing the, the crucial part, which is, which is like the, all the complexity that is hidden behind reactive streams. And in this blog post series in advanced reactive Java, you have, you have the TCK covered and you have the complexities covered. So this is actually a nice place to look at as well. That's all I had. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. Just wait for the mic. Uh, otherwise, I'm here today until the end of the today's conference, so feel free to catch me. Yeah, I see a question up there, but I'm not sure they will be able to. OK.
So as long as I can hear, the question was a, about why, why, why are there, is the reactive uh, approach in, in streaming better than a uh, typical like, blocking approach? So why, why back pressure, why asynchronous? And the answer is, uh, it was somewhere on the slides, that uh, basically it's all about uh, reusing, the, reusing the resources. So if you, if, if you work in a, in a synchronous environment, in the blocking one, the threads are blocked basically. And the, the, the core idea behind reactive is, is to like, release the resources whenever you don't actually need them. So not to block them, but, but give them back so that something else can use them. And actually, that's, so this is about the asynchronicity. And, actu and, and back pressure is actually also about, uh, about limited resources, because if, w w when I spoke about ways to deal with excess data, well, there are some approaches that are not the best you can imagine, like, like dropping or, or blocking or buffering the data, because this can lead to some problems. And actually, back, what back pressure allows you to do is uh, when you think of an like, uh, integration architecture, when you have different systems that work at different speeds, and back pressure is like a built-in concept that lets you deal with those different speeds gracefully without worrying about uh, running out of memory or running out of other resources. There is one more question here. Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, but the, here's a mic, and I think... There should be someone to pass it, but let's just... <laughs> Can we have the, the audience mic, please? Okay, so you can ask here and I will repeat the question. <laughs> So the question is about comparing uh, the, the streams in Java and Reactive streams with Kotlin coroutines. Uh, and actually, the honest answer is I don't know, because like, I've heard about coroutines in Kotlin, but I know, don't know the implementation details. So I don't want to, to give you any answer, because it would probably be wrong. Be wrong. Sorry for that. So the question is whether the, the integration demo is going to pass the TCK. Uh, I think it would, because I really wasn't using any code of my own. I, I was using like, their implementations, like Project Reactor, RxJava, and Dakka Streams. And uh, as far as I know, they are tested against the TCK. So I didn't, I didn't use any component that I wrote myself, like the publisher. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it would. OK, one more question. I'm going back to the stage. <laughs> Oh, sorry, you got it? Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, a simple one, actually. Uh, is any one of those nice to haves that you mentioned during the talk actually being developed as part of future JDKs? Or did Oracle basically just develop the interfaces and they sort of abandoned the project? So this is really a good question, and actually I'm, I'm not aware about any initiative uh, of implementing it. So this is like the, the moment we are in now. It's like a decision moment, and it's really like the, the, the future of the, of the JDK is, is being decided now. Because if uh, actu actually I don't think they are implementing it. So if no one else develops it as, a pa as part of Open JDK, for example, it's really not going to be there. So if you are, for example, willing to have something like that, feel free to try to implement it. But uh, as you saw, it, it may not be simple. So even Oracle dropped support for the reactive stuff in the uh, asynchronous database connector. So, but unfortunately, well, the, I, I, I don't want to give any personal opinions here, but this is like, well, you, you don't see anyone implementing that. It would be nice to have, but if no one implements it, it's not going to be there. So that's pretty much it. Okay, so I don't see any other hands, so thank you once again, and feel free to catch me afterwards.